All right, so a couple of things. We are going to continue from last uh, Tuesday's lecture. And um, I will also show you today, I'm following the book in many ways. So I'm gonna show you also what sections of the book you will need to, for, to use for your homework as well and for the studying this week. And um, I'm going to make available a um, quiz for this week that you will have until tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday, tomorrow night, 11.45 to do, all right? And that's gonna be on material we cover this past week. Same thing like the other one, you know, multiple choice at the higher level, it's more a conceptual. I will give you more conceptual questions on that. Um, one more comment um, before I start the, the lecture uh, and ask you if you have any questions from anything before. Um, I am willing to give extensions to homework, uh, but it will be limited to a day after the deadline because um, I tested it this week. There are a lot of people who have good reasons to submit homework later, but if they accept it and they want them to submit it, then I cannot put the, the solutions. And then, so I just uploaded the solutions for homework one. I don't wanna limit everybody else from having access to solutions of that homework, of the homework of the previous week. So I have decided to extend the, um, to give for good reasons, if you approach me ahead of time, and I and I think that those reasons are valid, to give you one more day. If you need a lot more than that, then as you remember, we said we are going to have a makeup assignment before the midterm and one makeup assignment uh, before the after the midterm. Excuse me, and one makeup assignment before the final. And we are going to do that. So for those of you who had to miss something. All right, that for a valid reason, obviously, to be able to take the assignment and make up the points that you missed. But I, as I said, I will be only giving you an extra day. That's it. That's it. All right, so keep that in mind. And don't come here and tell me I was sick, I could not do that. I understand all of this. It's not like that I'm going to criticize you or anything. I do understand, but at the same time, we have to keep the class running, all right? Okay, any questions so far from what we said? I tried to, these are my notes and I have already uploaded them. So you can follow them, but practically the first, the, the most, most of the things that we did last time was primarily to um, do a review, but like a very brief review of transmission lines. And my hope is that through ideal transmission lines, through that review and the homework that you got, for the first, uh, you had an opportunity to go and review the things that we are supposed to know in this class. Now, we are gonna start building on those things, all right? That's why, and what we have to build on is a lot of material, so that's why I cannot spend more time. Also, I had two problem-solving sessions last week. On the one on Saturday, there were three people, and then there was only one. So that's Saturday, all right? Um, and this is, this is supposed to be a free time for me, but I'm using it. Um, if you don't show up, in my mind, how should I in, interpret that? Like what kind of interpretation should I give it? I, I leave it up to you, I don't know. I mean, think, put yourselves in my position, what would you think? I don't mind teaching a class even for one person. I've done this uh, once. <laughs> I did it for a person that needed to graduate and he had an accident. He was a football player. He had a really big accident. He could not be drafted because of that. And he needed his degree to go out and work. And I gave him a class for a whole semester with one person. So I do that. I've done this my career many years, a lot of things. So I don't mind and I will keep doing it. I will not, however, do anything without anybody there. Because <laughs> it's how it, it feels like kind of crazy, all right? Mm -hmm. to, to be on a Zoom by yourself and then solve problems. <laughs> um, so as long as there are a few people, I will do this, but uh, I do hope that you read those things and you use them. Because 
the one thing about you think right now that if you have it there, you're going to use it. If it accumulates, you're not going to use it. So I can give you anything you wish, but if you don't do it immediately, if you don't look at that, it's not going to work. Okay, so that is just some observations. I would like to share them with you. And you know that at the end of the third week, which is this one, I'm going to try to do an assessment. And the assessment now, we, I don't have too many grades. You know, I just have some observations. I would like to hear your views. So most probably it's going to be for you now that you have three weeks. But we are going to just doing these asse uh, assessments every three weeks, all right? As we said. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a survey over the weekend. You do it. You will get a few points. I'm not going to ask you to give me an immediate deadline. I know it takes time. It will be nice for me to have it within next week. It's going to be a simple survey and you're going to get points out of it just to hear your opinion about things, how we do things. All right, so now, and with the pause, let me make a pause before I start. Any comments you would like to have? Yes. So, <clears throat> like you have the problem solving sessions, are you doing those? I mean, you were just doing them. And I put them on video. Yes. Yes. Were you just doing that the first week? You know? No, I'll do them every week. Are they going to be the same date and time? Yes. Okay. All right. So it's going to be one on um, Tuesday. On Tuesday, there was only one person that needed, uh, what did I say? I do Tuesdays and Saturdays, isn't it? Thursdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Okay. So today we have an office hour. I'm, I'm on there. I will solve problems. Um, and I will solve problems similar to your homework. All right, so I, it's not going to be the same. I will make it up right on the spot. <laughs> you, can test, you can test me, you know, see how I'm doing. Um, okay, um, so yeah, for those, I will solve problems. I will put them on Canvas, and I will also incorporate the video app. There are a lot of students, some students, not a lot. I tend to say a lot of there, not. There are a few students who have good reasons not to be in, in um, and they are in the lectures, they ask for the Zoom. I have to tell you, I will give that a little bit of less importance according, uh, uh, among other things. So I will put those, I have the videos, I need to edit them. Editing takes me a long time. And these videos are about 450 megabytes because it's an hour and a half and so forth. So I will do them every weekend. That's what I decided. Every weekend, I will do that for those who need them. But you're, gonna, you're not going to have them immediately. I just don't have enough hours of the day to do that with my research group and everything else, all right? And everything else that I need to do as a faculty. I will do my best, but I just wanted to give you an idea. I put, I'll, I'll try to every weekend to edit and have them privately available, but then the other ones that I will edit and have it to, for everybody will be for the uh, for the problem solving session. All right. So today, what we would like to do is to start with. You remember we said that we started with ideal transmission lines because they give us a good foundation on which to build other more complex structures. So now we are going to start with the complex structure. The microstrip is one. Uh, you will see it multiple times. You will see it in the lab as well. For those of you who have done some internships, probably you have seen it before. It's everywhere in, this, in digital circuits and then almost everywhere in um, microwave circuits. All right. Now, all of these lines for high frequencies have two conductors. We said that. All right. Why do we need two conductors? We need two conductors. Four. One, the current that flows this way and is excited, provided by the source to come back to the source. Otherwise, we cannot close the circuit. And you cannot have a high frequency circuit without having a closed path. All right? All right. So, in, in also we said, if you look, all of these dimensions are extremely important. So, the, that the width of the microstrip, as we call it, the thickness of the conductors, they tend to be, even in reality, these metallizations differ. So, for example, for those of you who may have done some CMOS um, based applications, you will you will hear that some of the higher metals are thicker than the lower metals. There is a reason for that. 
usually in the higher metals, we put RF applications where we need more of a thickness. Otherwise, we will have higher losses. And in the DC applications, we'll, we need lower metallization. But here, for this class, we will assume that all metals have the same thickness. Okay? And so thickness is important, as we will see later. So we assume that we have a, just a simple microstrip line somewhere excited by a source, somewhere terminated at a load. All right, so we close the circle. Now we go a little closer now. Well, this is this line is not an ideal line, but you will see how we can design it to make it almost ideal. All right. So to be able to do that, let's go and, and look very carefully at what happens in this line. First of all, the two conductors are separated by an dielectric that has a thickness H extremely important. It has a dielectric constant epsilon and so forth. We'll talk about other also what is other characteristics of the materials and the conductors. But for the time being, let's assume that there are no losses. All right. So what you see here is that the sizes I only have placed them here and here, but in reality there are a few up here. Not many. The closer the two metals, the more the charges that will face um each other all right because they are trying to go the distance as the dis why is that because of electric forces as the distance between charges becomes smaller what happens to the electric forces that bind them increase substantially and how do this how does this electric force coulomb's force how does it change in three dimensions with distance one over distance square. So a little bit of a change can make a big difference on how these charges are brought together. So usually for an H that is very small compared to the wavelength, then these charges feel a lot of force. And they try to find the closest possible, the, the location that gives you the closest possible distance from the, the positive from the negative. So more, uh, however, in addition to that, there is this other thing that we said that the charges like to go into corners, all right? They like to go into these locations. And therefore, while we're going to have most of the charges here in the lower face of the conductor, depending on the size of the conductor, we'll also have charges accumulated. So you will see, since the charges here are unevenly distributed, then you will see lines initiating from the positive charges and then terminating into the negative charges underneath. Now, the difference between the upper conductor and the lower is that the lower conductor does not have these corners. So practically it's a much bigger surface. They are not constrained. And therefore, a lot of these uh, negative charges are also spreading out. And that's why. Why do, do they not all force themselves like this one? Because of what other force? The same Coulomb's force, but between charges of the same polarity. So there are forces that are pulling them apart. One negative charge from another negative charge will have the tendency to move away. All right. So there are these positive forces, these forces which are attractive. So they cannot go that far away because they have to stay here. And then, of course, they distribute away from each other as much as they can because of the repulsive forces. Okay, so this works. Now, because of that, what happens to the current? One current here goes like this. So always at the edges, you have the highest value of the current. Now, we never really, when we are looking at this as a transmission line, we'll consider the average value. All right, and maybe the value here is very high, but if you integrate to find the total current, it's a lot of this that contributes. Okay. Now, um, here, however, the current extends. Why is that important? For two reasons. First of all, because the current here, if you bring another microstrip that is not far enough from this one, then the two the currents from this and whatever uh, neighbor, neighboring microstrip you have will overlap. And what happens when currents overlap? They, they start connecting with each other. One current will affect the other because primarily are the fields, all right, that they come with them. 
And therefore, there is what we call crosstalk. Crosstalk means when one light is connected electromagnetically with another, or they're talking to each other. Somehow they are connected. You change one and the other feels the impact. All right? So um, the second thing is because the current, the, the charges flow here to the edges, and there are lines that will go even further out. All right? There will be some lines here. I did not do them like this, but if I were, to, to do a line like that, I will do two. One can go like this. Now, in, in reality, they are, very, they are weaker field lines. They are not as strong as the ones that I have because obviously these outer lines connect with some, you know, lonely charges out here. So they are, the distance between this charge and something like out here is so much bigger. So the, electro, the electric field that is excited between these two is gonna be weak. However, the lines are here. Now, what happens? What happens when the lines are there, the air, uh, in addition to the dielectric, plays a role in defining the field distribution, all right? And as opposed to a capacitor that you have seen in 322, where every, uh, the two metal plates are so close to each other, all right, that, um, and so, so flat parallel and so close to each other that practically every uh, electro electric line is in between the plates. And then we use the dielectric constant for that practically to compute the capacitance. Here, um, the, um, the electromagnetic field is going to see something, not just the dielectric, it's going to see the air. And therefore, to find the, the, the propagation constant of a transmission line like, like that, we have to take into account the fact that there is a portion of this electric field in the air. So we'll talk about this a little later today. In any case, if we, for now, forget about this, which we call higher frequency effects, right? But let's forget them a little more for a second. Practically, this line is not any different from a two-wire line, all right? So I can go back now to my basics. I say, okay, what is it that I know? I know the basics. I know these things. I know that if I have a two-wire line, then there's a current that goes positive along the positive direction, a negative current, and then I can write, I did not write all of the transmission line equations like you had last time, all right? But you, the uh, incident, current goes with like this, and eventually we'll put a loss in there, and the reflected current goes like that. So now, now let's talk a little bit about the losses. And because now is the time, and let's see what, um, what kinds of losses we have. All right, so you remember, we have two types of materials, excluding air, conductors and the dielectric. And I, that it is ideal in real life, but an ideal dielectric will have only an, a, a permittivity, which is real. And of course, zero free electrons, all right? Zero anything else type of a loss. So practically there's not have a, there are no losses because of the dielectric. And the conductors are perfect conductors, so sigma, Conductivity goes to infinity. All right. Well, that's nothing is ideal in real life. And therefore, what happens in a system like this, we see both a dielectric loss. And I talked a little bit about that, but I wanted to show you a, a visual to understand it. So we talked about now, let's focus on the material losses. When you talk about the material, people can talk about the loss of the material in different ways. And we'll come down to that understanding how to talk about it. But in reality, there, physically speaking, there are two types of losses. All right, and I have them here. One is a loss due to polarized diodes. What is that? This is an atom. Simple, all right? Um, a, positive and, um, nucleus and, and one electron in this particular. Okay. If there is no electric field, then all of these electrons 
other than other whatever other materials forces you have because of it. if there's a crystal crystal structure or something forget about all of these complexity things let's assume that you have all of these atoms randomly oriented all right the electrons will find themselves in different positions and so forth and when there is no field there is no nothing happening i mean there is a lot of happening in the material but let, for us electrical engineers nothing is happening electrically however <clears throat> In some materials, when I put an electric field, if the electric field goes like that, all right, then the electrons will try to go in that direction. All right. However, because in fact, they, <clears throat> it's, it will start, excuse me, the electrons will try to go to the opposite direction because usually, obviously, there is some positive charges that have implemented so they would try to go to what wherever towards the positive charge that is created which obviously is stronger than whatever you know they have seen at the nucleus so in any case in this particular case for this particular material the electric field polarizes the atom and many times you're gonna hear that saying that the center which is the nucleus of the atom is displaced displaced Yes, it is displaced because this, if the center is here and you say the positive center is here and the negative center, even if it's like a, an orbit, all right, uh, uh, if you average over time and the electrons move very fast, because it's really a cloud around the center, electrically, this is neutral, has zero, all right, charge, because the negative and the positive here cancel each other. So, the, so in terms of a charge, the, po the center of the positive charges and the center of the negative charge in one atom overlap and therefore provide neutrality. All right, so that happens here. However, in this one, the centers of the negative charges, all of the electrons will try to go into one direction and they will leave the nucleus, the positive charges in the opposite direction so there is the force that is going to be exerted by the electric field is going to force that displacement between the center of the negative charges and the center of the positive charges that is called a dipole and a uh, higher classes we would call it a dipole moment all right why we call it like that because there is energy that is needed to sustain that kind of arrangement and this energy, guess what? It comes out of the current that flows in the microscope line. All right, so how do we express that? We write the permittivity as a, comple as a complex number, a real part and an imaginary part. And this imaginary part, which we can measure and it can be given to us, is nothing else but an indication. It provides macroscopically an idea of the losses due to this microscopic events okay this is the one type of dielectric then we have losses due to movement of free electrons so here is what happens let's assume that your field now you have multiple electronic levels all right or or um in energy levels of electrons you have different like consider electrons in different orbits the ones that are closer to the nucleus have stronger forces that attach them to the nucleus. The, the ones that they are further out have weaker forces. So these are the most susceptible, is even with a little bit of an increase of temperature, for these ones to just escape from the upper, right? That's why some materials, if you put them in high temperature, they get some conductive property. But then with an electric field that is applied, these ones, all of these out there, the outer electron, uh, electrons will separate themselves from the atom totally. Not like this, but here, they're going to be totally out there and they will all run into one direction and they will create a current. And this current is called the conduction current in the dielectric. All right. So now we have these two types of losses. However, to simplify things, we don't speak about them as two separate things. We speak about them as one. And a lot of that, and these ones, 
as you see, we develop a function called the loss tangent because it's tangent that it's called the loss tangent. When you tell me loss tangent is this, I will understand what you're telling me. And what is the interesting thing? It's not only a function of epsilon double prime or epsilon prime and sigma, but it's a function of frequency. So now you start hearing some high frequency effects because what happens? If this is higher, if this is like a little bit higher than I wanted, and if this is higher and the frequency gets higher, this one grows really fast. So in higher frequencies, you're going to have less of a performance in terms of your losses will go higher. All right. So this is, as a matter of fact, the formula. A lot of times, you're not going to have to go there and do this. They will give you the loss tangent of the material and say, this material, and if you go to the web, and look for, for example, toroid, or you look for silicon. They will tell you the loss tangent is this one for these frequencies, and they will probably give you a table. All right? Now, I think in ADS they have something like this, and they do it automatically. But that's how you need to understand physically where those happen. That is your dielectric. Now we go to conductor. In the conductor, ideally, sigma is infinite. All right, conductor sigma. And that sigma here is different from the sigma of the dielectric. In the dielectric, sigma ideally has to go to zero. So an ideal dielectric has no free electrons. However, in conductors, ideally sigma has to go to infinity, which means what? In conductors, you have a, a, a C, a notion of negative electrons. And that's why the current can flow. Easily. So ideally, you would like to have sigma to go to infinity. And if sigma is infinity, then you have we have learned from electromagnetics that there is no field inside the conductor. All right? So ideally, no field inside the conductor. The current only flows on the surface. However, what did we say? Life is not simple. <laughs> so in real conductors, it does not matter how good they are. You have a small a, a sigma, which is not infinite. It might be very, very large, 10 to the 5 or something. But it's not infinite. So as this becomes smaller than infinity, you start seeing that there, is, there are some electrons that are flowing not only in the serpent, but inside the conductor. And so the current that flows in, because electrons flow inside the conductor, will flow in parallel this direction, in this particular case, but the current will show this exponential decay, all right, inside the conductor. And now we define a different delta. This delta and the other delta are not the same thing. All right, so keep it in mind. Unfortunately, we have this delta too. This is called the skin depth, all right? Think of your skin that is not infinitely thin. And there is a current in that. This is called the skin depth. And how do we define it? The, the, the depth inside the conductor where the value of this current that flows inside the conductor becomes one over e of the maximum value of the surface. And also, this is something that is given to you. Skin depth is something that people measure. They have it from other analysis. They will give it to you. And what else is a function of frequency. So everything points now to the following problem. The higher you go in frequency, the more of these effects come there. And that's why we are not going to do them in this class. We are going to touch on them, but we are going to talk about high frequency effects, which are extremely important to know if you design a ref circuits, a receiver, for example, all right, which operates in 5 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz, that some of these like uh, uh, frequency bands, as you learn from the magazine that you read, are bands that have been dedicated to communications. So if in your receiver, you forget about those things and you violate them, then nothing is going to work. All right? So that's the bottom line. So I said lambda delta should be delta. I will correct it like on the spot. I don't know why I wrote lambda. And every time I, I will upload this too, again, because I may write some more. All right, now, 
Um, now we go to another effect, which is how the uh, lines of the waves here, of the electric fields rather, electromagnetic waves, they just come out of the material and then they have this very strange distribution, right? The lines go like that. And as a matter of fact, if you wanna really find out how they go, you have to solve a very complex problem. You have to solve what we call the boundary value problem, like Maxwell's equations, where you take all the boundary conditions and there is a, a software that there are multiple softwares that do that. One of them is HFSS, the other is on it. There are all kinds of software that solve the full wave, as we call it, full wave problem. But for us, we want to avoid it. All right, so what do we do? Now we go into back to what we, every time we feel uncertain, what do we do? We go back to our basics, is that not true? We do that in life too. Every time we are faced with a challenge, we go back to the basics. That's why basics are important, all right? So what is our basic knowledge? Ideal transmission lines. What happens in ideal transmission lines, if you remember, uh, from both electrostatics, magnetostatics, and electromagnetic? But let's take the statics piece. If now I consider that my two conductors have charges, all right, accumulated here and there, positive and negative, and then the electric field lines go like that. Then you see that every, all of my electric, if you say the, the two lines were like, I don't have two pencils, but assume the two lines were like two pencils, then the electric field lines will be exactly in between the two lines in the ideal conductor, all right? so. If I have Z as the direction of propagation in this line, E is gonna be perpendicular to Z, all right? So, or transverse to Z, as we call it. Then what happens to now consider the current as opposed to charges? And therefore there is a magnetic field. And if this current goes like that, the magnetic field for this is gonna go like this. And the magnetic field for that is gonna go like that. That's why we have lines that you need to have opposite directions in the current. So the magnetic fields are trapped in here. They sum up here and they cancel outside. You remember that we did this from magnetostatics. Okay. Now, if you look at the magnetic field, if you have a, a if you have a current like this, the magnetic field is gonna be going like that. So the magnetic field lines are also perpendicular on a plane which is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So the magnetic field lines are also transverse, all right? And what does this do? Then we say this is a transverse electric and magnetic line. We call it a TEM. So when somebody tells you, you have a TEM line, you understand what it means very close, an ideal transmission line is a pure PEM line. Okay, so now we got that, but let's go a little further down and make some observations. If I get a microstrip, for example, as my first observation, and then I uh, start with, I operate it, I have a microstrip line goes to a low. And at first, I excite it with a source which is at 100 megahertz, and the line has been designed, ideally, for 10 gigahertz. If I go from very, very low frequency, practically, and I measure then the electric and magnetic fields, what I will see for the line, even if the fields go out, for example, of the dielectric, I will see that both the electric field and the magnetic field of this are transverse to the direction of propagation. In real lines, that does not happen for all frequencies. In ideal transmission lines, which are TEM lines, they have a transverse electric and magnetic field to the direction of propagation for every frequency, for all frequencies, from zero to infinity, for example, all right? However, in planar transmission lines, like microstrip, coplanar, strip line, and so forth, that is not true. It 
at you have yes you have a pure tm performance at the low frequency end but at some point when you cross a frequency or you approach crossing that particular frequency we call it the cutoff frequency then you start seeing electric magnetic electric and magnetic field components which are also longitudinal all right so uh, planar lines especially two conductor lines they will have a whole good frequency range where they behave as tm but the moment you go your frequency higher than that this line loses that character and why is it important to know what this is because the moment you even approach that without crossing it your line starts having different and all kinds of high frequency effects is not working as a transmission line so you have to avoid being even close to that near all right and we'll talk a little bit on how later on how you avoid that so because these lines like micro strip strip line and so forth they are not pure tm lines meaning they only are tm for a frequency range we call them quasi tm all right so you will hear that term quasi tm lines and a lot of times we talk about that because we want to be careful so in a microstream when do you have this when are you sure you're not going to have this quasi tm mode when your thickness of the substrate is less than a thousand of the wavelength if it's less than that you don't worry about transmission characteristics you don't worry about parasitic effects if you your line has an edge somewhere you don't worry about those things you don't worry about high frequency parasitic effects the moment your age becomes above even that does not even have to be a hundred if it's a hundred <laughs> you have you seriously have a problem for example if i have a microstrip well age is eight let's say it's um one centimeter all right for example pretty thick but low frequencies um for low frequencies if however i take this thick centimeter centimeter and um try to push and in this i try to push the frequency higher than one thousand of a centimeter is going to be 10 to minus 2 10 is going to be um 10 to minus 2 10 to minus 3 10 to minus 5 is going to be 10 microns all right if for example um a thousand of that for for uh, well i talked about the wave have to go to the wavelength let's assume that you are at 30 at one gigahertz for for a hundred centimeter um, one centimeter thickness um one gigahertz is 30 centimeters all right so 30 centimeters wavelength divided by a thousand is gonna be 0 0.03 or oh, not point is one over three it's thir th 30 centimeters times um 30 centimeters and then divided by a thousand is going to be 30 divided by 100 yeah 0 0.03 of a centimeter 0 0.03 of a centimeter makes it 0.3 millimeters makes it 300 microns so for example you have to be around that maybe i'm a little too strict <laughs> but in this case if you are comfortably like this then you know you're not going to have any high frequency effects because you may have transmission line like almost a quasi atm transmission line on a line but the moment you try you find a discontinuity then all of a sudden at that point you have high frequency modes all right so in any case you are comfortably in a quasi tm mode if you are very strict and if you try to make sure that your thickness is very thin all right if you will see for example in cmos applications they're going to higher frequency the thickness can be like a micron between the metals a fraction of a micron all right and then that's what makes it 
uh, able to operate at much higher frequencies. So um, in any case, let's use that or approximately that for our class. We are going to choose it anyway, but you keep that in mind. Now, a line that satisfies somehow this, where you comfortably feel that your age is much smaller than your wavelength, can be modeled as an ideal transmission line. All right, an ideal transmission line means a pure TM. That does not mean that an ideal transmission line does not have losses. All right, so you can have an ideal transmission line, but with losses in there. So that is going to take us to looking at transmission lines with losses in the system, which we have not done in 322. So what happens if you have a transmission line with losses? There, there, of course, one thing is that your wave is, as it moves down the line, it's going to change its phase. Remember we said that because it's a cosine omega t minus beta z type of wave. When you move along the line, the cosine omega t minus beta z, the beta z component changes. So practically, as a wave moves along the line, it changes its phase. But with losses, one more thing is happening. Not only the phase changes, but its amplitude too. And losses with lower the amplitude, all right? So it shows like as your voltage wave goes down the line, the amplitude for this wave is gonna get smaller. And of course the current is gonna get smaller too. Okay, so these two parameters try to help us take care of those effects. Beta, which is called propagation constant or wave number. It shows you how your phase changes Alpha, which is loss, loss factor or attenuation constant. It shows you how your amplitude changes, all right? And therefore, what happens in this particular case, and I can write it here, let me write something. So practically, I can write here, and let me see, I will add pages when I write, if you don't mind. Add a page. And then I will move a little bit this down. Okay, so what I can write for a bit, you remember before in the lossless case, still ideal transmission line, we had V plus of Z was B zero plus E to the minus J beta, beta Z. You remember that, all right? Now, however, it's gonna be, is we are gonna change this. And instead of beta Z, we are gonna have minus gamma Z. What is this gonna do for us? It's gonna do the following. It's gonna bring to V naught plus this factor here. Which shows the attenuation. And then we are gonna have this factor here, which as before shows the change of phase, all right? And of course, the same thing is gonna happen with I minus and I plus. And um, for, I can write V, V minus V is gonna be a V naught minus E. Now I will write it plus here, V, E to the J beta Z. All right, and then the reason you say you have an A, E to the A Z is because the wave goes along this different direction. All right, but it's always negative. I mean, it's, excuse me, in reality, when you start plugging um, in according to the right direction of the coordinate system, always these factors will be negative. All right, so there is no increase of the voltage, there is always reduction, whether it is an in, a wave going in the positive Z direction or a wave going in the negative Z direction. Okay, so that's how we write it. Now, 
we said that um, last time that if we have an um, ideal transmission line, then it would take a very small section of the ideal transmission line. This very short section, all right, the section DZ. Let's assume that I have this very short section DZ here. Okay. And then I want to represent this. Let's assume that here. That's A. We call that the input port to the this very small section. And this is the output port. Now, for that, I can find a, an equivalent circuit in terms of an inductance. And this inductance represents the impact of running along the line. All right, so moving a current along the line is like an inductive effect because it forces the current to spend the distance between the input port and an output port, all right? And I will say a little more about that too. But because the length is small, it's LDZ. And then it's a capacitance here, DZ. And therefore, in this particular case, I have represented my very short section of transmission line with an LC circuit. Why do I do that? First of all, when we have an inductor, what happens to the current that flows through an inductor compared to the current that flows through a wire? Let's assume that you have a simple, let's assume that you have, I mean, a wire, a, not a wire like this, not a transmission line, but these two points, all right, electro electrically are identical. You see here? Electrically, whatever applies here in terms of a current, the current here and the current there will have the same value, all right, in the lower, this wire that you use in your circuits. It, that at A, and if I call AA prime, let me call this, okay, this is B and this is B prime. So the current between A prime and B prime is the same. Well, if I do not have, no, it's not exactly the same because I have this. I mean, it's from Kirchhoff's law, but let's, let's assume that I put it here so I don't confuse you. Here, C prime, uh, excuse me, and C, even if the potential is the same, C prime here. All right, so if I look at the current that comes towards C prime, all right, so if I look somewhere here for the current, before it reaches C prime, the current here and the current there, it would be identical. Don't you agree? Okay, that's what we do in circuit theory. But what happens with the current here and the current just before C? If I were to see that in the time domain, what would I say? That this current is doing what? is lagging. Why is that? Because it has to go all through to this. It takes longer to go through this wire, all right? And in fact, the, the inductor takes care of the fact that for a current to go from A to B in transmission lines, it takes time because A, A to B from this to that is a physical distance. While this to this, there's no physical distance involved. So whenever the current has to flow through a physical distance, it takes longer from if the current were at the same point, all right? And that inductor takes care of it. Now, what happens with this capacitor? Why do we have the capacitor there? 
Because if I have two wires, which are charged, there are charges there, all right, obviously, then what happens? There is, there is time that it takes, all right, as I excited with the voltage, it's gonna take time until all of the charges align here and all of the charges align there and I have the maximum capacitance, all right? It takes time for this. So practically, that is the capacitor, capacitance that takes care of that effect. So if the lines are very short, then I can do this very simple equivalent circuit. So the question is next. Ah, okay, before we go to anything next after the short, let's go to what happens if now my, my lines have lost. If lines, if the lines have losses, we have other effects there that we need to take into consideration, all right? So it's not only true that the, for the current to go from this point to that point, it's gonna feel like it goes through an inductor, but when the current goes from here to there, it also loses part of its energy. And how do we represent that by a resistor, all right? Remember the, uh, attenuation factor, the E to the minus AZ. So when the current goes from here to there, or the voltage, the magnet has already dropped. So we need to put this resistor for that. Okay. And not only that it drops because of the conductor losses in the metal, it also drops because of the dielectric losses in the dielectric. Small, but important. So in here, to take care of these losses, we put a conductance. So um, what you really see as an equivalent circuit, let me do it here, A, A prime, B, B prime, A, A prime, B, and B prime, all right? And these are important because if somebody can give me R, L, G, and C, as we have seen in 322, then we can find the characteristic impedance of the line and the complex propagation constant, all right? And you remember we have seen those two equations. All right, let's look at some other things. Very interesting, obviously. Now, a good line in a good line, R and G, will be very small to this product, omega L. Otherwise, if R is so big like this one, that's not a good line. <laughs> Whatever you're gonna give in there is gonna be absorbed into losses, all right? So always we design a line to have R by choosing a good conductor, to have R that is very small compared to this, and by choosing a good dielectric, we have G very small compared to that. What does this do? Here, it makes a difference to characteristic impedance. So even if you have loss if your characteristic impedance, because this is R is much smaller than this, I can ignore it. Because G is very small compared to that, I can, can ignore it. And therefore, my characteristic impedance remains real. And it's identical to the characteristic impedance of my line without losses. That's great news, all right? Otherwise, we'll be in great trouble because our Z naught will change with frequency. There is nothing worse than having that in your design. So at least we are good here. Of course, this one, we still have a real and an imaginary part, and we keep that. All right, so in for a full characterization of a line, somebody will give you R, G, L, and C, but you will need only L and C for Z naught, and you will need all of these for alpha and beta. All right, to find. And the moment I have, the moment I have these characteristics, 
then I can I can re re uh, represent my microstrip line with an ideal transmission line with loss. All right. Now the question, therefore, is how do we go there? And now I'm gonna go and show you um, another that I have already placed on Canvas. And then it will be in also in your textbook. So I will show you where in the textbook I will go to use formulas important for us, all right? The formulas that I would like to use is primarily to go from R, G, L, and C that somebody's gonna give me or to go, excuse me. <laughs> how I, I can go that is not and gamma we see, but how to go from the geometry of the microstrip to R, G, L, and C. All right, that's not obvious. So um, let me, first of all, show you um, something which is very important pre before even we go to um, R, G, L, and C. So let me see here. So you remember what I said, and that is in fact the formulas that I that you will find in your, just put them on a PowerPoint. These are formulas that are in the, um, let me go back and show you to remind you what you have to study. In this one, this is, I told you that we are gonna study, maybe I will also put it underneath uh, Thursday. This is the section of that volume. I have taken these five volumes that I told you that are available. You can download them, but look at what I have done because there's so much material in there, we don't need it. So what I have done in this volume, okay, well, I'm not gonna do anything until Okay, perfect. Last time I <laughs> I stopped that and I was losing the connection. So now I learned. Um, okay, so um, in the books we have, and might be easier for me to get the books, not from Canvas because it takes so much time, but from my files and files here in fact i um what is uh, yeah yeah i will show you that easier okay what i've done in this i removed uh, some sections that i thought they were kind of uh confusing but here, I would like you to read those things, all right? Read them. And then these are things that will be important, all right? So number one, and um, that you need to keep in mind is the following. To be able to find the, so you will have to read this from your, that section, right? That I put there. In um, a wave propagates, an electromagnetic wave, propagates with a velocity of light in free space. However, if you put an electromagnetic wave and uh, move, um, force it to propagate in a dielectric, it's gonna slow down, all right? It's not gonna have the same velocity like free space. It's gonna have a different velocity, which we are gonna call the phase velocity of that wave. So our transmission line, the microstrip, um, does not go like a, the, uh, with the speed of light because a lot of the majority of the field is inside the dielectric and the dielectric has a dielectric constant. So what happens when a wave is propagating inside a medium that has both epsilon and mu? All right, for free space, if you put mu naught and epsilon naught, this one becomes the velocity of light, all right? If you put these two values for 
free for free space epsilon naught and mu naught then this one gives the velocity of light however when you go and then here's the velocity of light lambda naught all right it gives you the velocity of light which is this it will give you accordingly the wavelength and you can see how to find the wavelengths for that you know how to do this? I always use one gigahertz, and I remember that one gigahertz in free space has 30 centimeters. And then you go, when you go higher, it goes lower. When you go lower, it goes higher. But that's how I don't do this calculation all the time, all right? So that's how I remember it. Okay, now let's assume that you are in a dielectric and epsilon is above epsilon naught. A dielectric is going to have, as we have seen in statics, and I can write it here. I don't think I can write, but in a, di in a, in a dielectric, your epsilon is going to be the product of epsilon sub bar, which is a relative dielectric constant, epsilon naught. All right, you remember that? And your mu is going to be your mu sub bar, which is a relative permeability times mu sub naught. Good news is for a dielectric, mu sub bar is one. So always for a dielectric, mu equals mu sub naught. However, epsilon, because epsilon sub bar is, in, for example, epsilon sub bar for silicon is 11.7. So epsilon for silicon is going to be 11.7 times epsilon naught. Epsilon sub bar for gallimacinide is 12.4. For quartz is four, all right? So all different materials. For duroid is 2.5, for example. So this. So that tells you how much your epsilon is. And therefore, by following this, what I find is uh, that I can compute the velocity of the wave in any medium where I know epsilon sub r and mu sub r. The other thing I can say from these calculations, and you can find that your velocity of the wave, and in fact, in this case, let me go here. Where is it? Yeah. What you can find out is that the velocity of the wave here, which is going to be one over square root of epsilon nu, if your epsilon equals epsilon sub bar, epsilon sub naught, and nu equals nu sub naught, which is for a dielectric, then your V sub P, we call it V or V sub P, is going to be C divided by square root of epsilon sub bar. And that's the velocity of your wave in a dielectric. All right. So let's go back to. Um, where we were here. So now, uh, here it gives you some examples, and I suggest that you do these little examples. The solutions are here, but you have to do them to practice a little bit. This is where now, due to losses, this becomes important. Don't know why it's this weird. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I will do this. I cannot fix it right now. I think um, it was it was it was not supposed to be equal to j sub omega c. It was supposed j omega c to be down here. To this. All right, I was I will fix it before we go and I put it there. I will place it correct. So you 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 know what I said? I said that g is not j omega c. G is just a conductance charging the line and j omega c is the capacitance of course with frequency all right that has j omega c has the units of a conductance all right so now now is what i showed you myself before in the book that shows you in fact what is a transmission line of a given length delta c but given r l g and c okay and then they go to this transmission line. I mean, they, they do it a repeat of transmission line. The, then this is what we talk. I did not cover the repeat. You can see that, but this is in fact 
the not, and this is gamma, which we have seen, but they have it there as a review. Okay, so now, in this one, it gives you two problems. One where they give you R, L, G, and C, and you find alpha, beta, and Z naught. All right, do you remember what we said that if somebody gives those to you, you can find the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and the attenuation and propagation constants. This is a very nice example. And also you find the phase velocity, all right? You see that it's less than the velocity of light in free space. Now, in there, there will be a lot of, um, and then I will like to uh, attract your attention to that. There is a lot of discussion in this. You can read it if you want. This is the microstrip, all right? It has also differences. Um, these are also some, I mean, that's why I did not like this book tremendously. I like the examples because um, it does some things and then it goes to planar lines. But here is what I would like to say. We will read that on transmission lines, planar transmission line structures. This is what we covered, the microstrip, all right? Forget about coplanar waveguide and so forth. I will make you a list of the sections you have to read, but I would like to uh, take your attention to where you get the formulas. If you go down here, Okay, these are the formulas that I have for effective permittivity and characteristic impedance in my notes. And there, let me see. Um, okay. Right, so here. These are the two formulas. I will put the same, the same similar formula also for you on PowerPoint to help you. But these are the formulas that give you the characteristic impedance for a dielectric that has epsilon sub r epsilon r, phase velocity, but then also it gives you something else which is important. Remember we said that there are lines that are extended in the air. Because of that, you have to change the uh, dielectric, um, relative dielectric constant into an effective dielectric constant, an effective, all right? And that takes into account the fact that part of the lines are in free space. So some people will give you that, or they will give you, you use this formula, they give you H and W and H, uh, over, over W is not very small. I will finish those because you will find the use. These are all formulas that you can use. You, can, uh, you, you identify this alpha and this um, B and from here you identify epsilon sub R. Um, I need to find what this U is. Let me see. It's another, I have not finished those, but I will put there those for you and I will see more of them next time. But what I wanted to say is that if you look at the formulas, you will not anymore have to do any electromagnetic work. You just have to know why this, for example, looks like that and it's not just epsilon sub r because the field is in space, in, in free space. So you have to, Calculate that, and the moment you have this, effectively you find zero. All right. So this is what this has nothing to do with losses, but it's because you have an electric field that goes out in the air, and therefore the effective dielectric constant is like a mix of epsilon naught and epsilon sub r, and that you will find it here. We're gonna solve some problems of that next time. And also the problems we're gonna do next time will involve um, computing R, L, G, and C for a microstrip, all right? So that's what we are gonna do. But I hope now you can see what, what are, how we are thinking about planar transmission lines.
right? The kinds of effects that we see from the fact that they are not ideal, all right? That they have a particular structure and then they incorporate specific materials. Okay, so we'll see you on Tuesday. And in the afternoon, we'll have problem solving. 2.30 to 4. Mm -hmm. Things are loose, um, after the session, and we know about people, but I might be able to. It's not that I'll post the slides, but the video is going to take me some time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The slides, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. I was wondering how I should approach problem number two here. So when I'm looking this way, I want it to see 50 ohms, right? Because I'm Let me see what I say because I don't <laughs> I want to... Okay, this is uh, homework two. This is homework two. I assume that you're doing the value it should be should be so that we have maximum transfer of Yeah, power. I mean, this okay, one should just be... This one should just be 50 one. plus J30. Yeah, 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 it's just called the top Yeah, two. that's what people do. Yeah. Okay, this, this one... is an ideal transmission line, like two wires. So right, think, yeah. but you want this... When you're looking from A prime forward, you want it to see 50 ohms, right? So that you match the source and units. Okay, assume that this is ZS. ZS mm -hmm. is 50 ohms. ZL is, right is that. And find the ideal transmission line matching network. So like what we've done in the other form. So maximum power is delivered to the load. Okay. You have to to the load. You right. can therefore to save how much is this gonna be. Right. So you want previous. looking this way yes, from yes. A prime, yeah, you want yeah, it to yeah. look like 50 ohms, right? Yes. So that you match. Okay. Yes. So you exactly. should use you to... this formula, right? You don't know what is in there. I know, but you want Z in A A prime to be 50. Yes, you but know you the don't... characteristic impedance. No, but it's not a single line. Ideal transmission line matching network. You make okay. it a single set. Live. We did in the past yes, homework. Yes, in the past homework. It may have something more than that. Okay. All right. Okay. So you cannot assume. So you have to see if this is 50 ohms and this is how much. Mm -hmm. So we need to add is, a shunt you, stub so that you yes, can you get do, rid of that. Of Plus, you need to move the 100 to 50. Okay. How do we do that? Because With the quarter wavelength transformer. Quarter wave transformer. So put a quarter wave transformer. Plus and then after the quarter wave transformer, you want the stub. Yes. You can put it before or after. All right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, I think so, yeah. It's like the previous okay. one yeah, okay, okay. okay. we've done. Okay. And then yeah. think of this is the guy, this is a section of okay. a quarter wavelength transformer. Right. Plus stub. Okay. So, so essentially, we're just adding in those components mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. Okay. But you will have the... to decide if the stub, you want your stub to be open or short. Okay. Um. Don't make it too long. Okay. So yeah. try to find <laughs> the one that's going to make it the shortest right. distance. Okay. So you okay. just have to look up which one will add admittance versus yes. which one will. Yes. So you need a Smith okay. chart to be pretty yes. helpful for this. Oh, yeah, yes. And then what do I say after These that? These ones are just geometries, I think. Yeah. Or this one's a geometry of a microchip. They put the ticket and a grant and it goes as a print on the right. Also, assume the design frequency, identify the geometry length and the of the various microchip line sections you're using the MT you have designed, okay? And usually to find this in not, there, there are, look into the um, book, and okay. there are four. So okay. that, that yeah. would just be for the length of the stub, right? You're finding you the geometry of the length of the stub. The length no, of the width. The and width the of, of the. Yeah, okay. because the length you. Well, okay, that, you have the length of the stub, yes. but so that's what it. That's what it's referring to, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But I give you epsilon sub R and H. So practically, you have to find the width of the microscope. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, it's using so those equations that were that were given to. Okay. So we would need to do that for the stuff. I think so. And yes. the port, yeah. And yeah. the portal yeah. transformer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So the same question. So yeah. So for the line, so I need to like for. Um, uh, better so this would be like the quarter like, like yes because this um but i but you have to if you do that then, then you have to put a stub somewhere you have to think where is the best place to put the stub oh try to put it here why here it's better place to, to put it here because you're going to immediately cancel that oh. to put it before to put it before the after after, after. after. yes oh. because you immediately cancel it no, no, yeah okay yeah. Yeah. okay yeah. yeah so just like the law okay yeah is but it, you can do it either way. Does it really right. matter whether you do a short or an open? Or is it like, no. I guess it depends. Uh, but... If your short is going to be, if one of the distance. two will be 
shorter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the shorter is probably the, the better. Shorter the better. Okay. Unless it's yeah. like almost zero, then you go to the next length. Okay, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry about this. Oh, I yes, I know. I, have, I know it's been um, that's the best way to do it. I, I, in fact, I have so many, I need to call them. Okay. And I will say yes for all of that. Probably the best way to do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thank yeah, you. Um,